Hi, welcome to The Stitch TV Show. I'm Lynn. And I'm Pam. We're happy you're joining us today. The Stitch is an online quilt talk show, the perfect soundtrack for your sewing room. Join us for twice monthly talk shows like this one, virtual <laughs> stitching, celebrity interviews, and podcasts. You can learn more at thestitchtvshow.com. Our show today is brought to you by QT Fabrics, and we have Pixie Dots. We also have the same teleprompter problem, so <laughs> it's just going to be a wild ride, guys. Hang in there. Very excited, Pixie Dots. So again, by the time this episode comes out, this bundle will have made its way to a new home. Right. However. However, we're also sponsored by Femore Cutlery. <gasps> and. Which is, will keep you sharp. Yes, you can stay sharp with Femore Cutlery. And right. in more exciting news, mm -hmm. there's going to be a giveaway uh, for Femore Cutlery. Oh, that's right. We have a whole bunch of stuff they have provided us to give away. So the first giveaway will go up with this episode. Right. It's very exciting. And so we will have details in the show notes and also in the little blurb on the YouTube video about where to go to enter, as well as when that giveaway will end. Usually they run for about a week after the giveaway starts. So be on the lookout for that and you too can win some fun Femore Cutlery. Yes. So... What's been up? I don't know. Spoiler alert. Oh, that's right. Mystery season. Mystery season. I, you know, it's always exciting when Bonnie Hunter does this and kicks it off and like everybody gets involved and runs to, is it Lowe's or Home Depot? This yeah, paint chips, basically. Paint chips. You go get the paint chips so that you can see you know, what colors will be in your mystery quilt. But every year, I just think the quilts are gorgeous. And oh. you don't have to stick to her colors. No, but... I went rogue. This is on Provence, which was last year's mystery. Uh, last year being started in 2016, ended early 2017. Uh, and my colors are a little brighter. I think I have... Uh, I think she did like grays and um, reds and yellows in hers. Maybe. I think so. I remember mine just, just a lot brighter. Mine usually are. I tend to... G take her colors as inspiration, and then uh, go a little more aggressively cheerful with right. them. But this year, the colors are um, like <gasps> some teals and oranges and browns. browns. And it's uh, on Ringo Lake. So it kicked off the last Friday of November. So it is in full force happening right now. Exactly. You're so, you're sewing all kinds of... All 280 kinds. half square triangles and you're sleeping one night. Exactly. Done. Done. So, yes. And you do them usually every year. I don't usually you? do, yeah. I'm gonna change the colors up this year. Although it's our show colors, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't do it. But when I I was recently going through my stash and kind of coming to terms with like, I don't think I'm going to use this range of fabrics anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I de-stashed quite a bit. So I got rid of some burgundies and I got rid of some dark greens. And it was a little bit of yardage and fat quarters and some of the scraps that I already have cut up, which we're talking about next. Oh, uh, yay. Yeah. Exciting. So yeah, I in doing that exercise of going through and having an honest look at my stash and the kinds of quilts I make now versus fabric that I've kind of inherited and just kept because you don't want to get rid of fabric. Exactly. Um, I have like a group of greens and I have a group of kind of medium blues and I think it would work well. I can bring the browns in and I think that'll look good, but then it's just like an all cool palette and there's no corals in there, I think. So, Which is sad. Know. That is sad. There should maybe, be always maybe orange. Maybe my neutral will be orange. There you go. Background. Now we're talking. Or not. Because oh. that might burn our it windows was. out. It's <laughs> not going to be good. So we are going to talk about um, scraps and Ruler work in quilting. Ruler work in quilting. Which is another popular request that we've had for show topics. Right. And we get to come at it from two different ways. Right. But first, but let's talk scraps. Let's and talk scraps. leaders and enders. Yes. And so I'm glad you're talking about this because I have to admit, you tried to start me down this path of taking my scrap bag and cutting them up into different sizes. And I did that for a while. And then I went... They're just in bins. Like, I'm not doing anything yeah. with them. So I got stuck in the process. Well, so and because that's what I want to ask you about. It's not the kind of quilts that you make. And right. so if you make scrappy quilts, this kind of organization system makes sense. If right. you don't, if you're more into applique, if you're more into art stuff, or you're more into improv piecing, it doesn't 
it doesn't make sense to do this because then you're just eliminating good fabric. Right. That you would normally use if it was in a different shape. But I did. I did use, because I challenged myself. I'm like, I got these bins. I need to use this. So I designed a pattern with scrappy fabric and I used one of the bins. But like I keep hearing people talk about this leaders and ender stuff and Bonnie's awesome at it. But I guess where I got stuck was how do you start? Like how do you you know, start using leaders and enders. And I'm like, what am I making? You're just sewing stuff. Like, mm -hmm. pretty much. And do it, you have a goal? Okay. So there, it's two different concepts. So scrap systems work well with leaders and enders, but vice versa. If leaders and enders is a way of working on two projects at the same time, basically. That's where I get like lost a little. But it, it means you have to have everything cut and kind of ready to go for both projects. Oh, no, and if you, you gotta like be more that, organized than yeah. what I am. So, so explain, explain to if our audience doesn't know, explain to them what leaders and enders are. So, leaders and enders are when you are, let's say you're sewing together little two inch scraps, and you do your first one, and then okay, you need to snip this and go press it. Well, rather than snip this and then leave the needle with like nothing under it. And the reason you don't want to do that is because lots of times when you start sewing, um, the fabric gets sucked into the hole in the needle plate. The other world in the yeah, mach just sewing machine goes in. Or awful. it gets like a weird fabric nest on the back. And so if you, so you sew this one and then you just come right on behind it with another two little pieces. And then you stop your needle down on this one, and then you snip this one, go off and press it. And then this one is just under the needle while you're taking care of pressing or whatever else. Okay. Then you come back, you finish this one, and then you get your next little set and vice versa. And then they're all kind of connected by chains. Right. So, so chain, it's chain piecing. It's chain piecing, essentially, but essentially for two different projects. Okay. So that's leaders and enders. Now, okay. it doesn't have to be squares. It doesn't have to be tiny squares. I've done it to where I'm leader and entering, sewing together blocks on a quilt top, and then sewing together units for a completely different quilt. And you just have to keep... See, I guess that's where I'm... going to keep it going. You got to keep track of it, though. Yes. That's the part that's, where I'm like... That's when it's How do you keep track? To that's... have two completely different projects. That way you're not going to accidentally commingle. Because if, like, all you make is orange quilts, <laughs> I'd be in say, trouble. <laughs> you're going to look at your stem like, I don't know which one goes to which. But if you have, like, orange quilt project and teal quilt project, you can very well tell the difference between those two. Unless right. you're colorblind, like my father-in-law, but he's not a quilter, so never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not important. Sorry, this episode's not for you. <laughs> so you always have to have a plan. Yes. If you're doing this leaders and enders now, and scrap stuff. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. I've seen you do this, and this is why So I'm like... I, I, when I don't have a plan or, like, an active second project to do this with, I have a bin like this one. This is my teal two-inch scrap bin. Yeah. All teals. I have one of this that's neutrals. So it's, like, whites, creams, whites with a little bit of print on them, text, whatever. Gray. And I will just grab these and just start making four patches as my leaders and enders out of the neutrals because I know I can always use that block in something. And that's like my default. I don't have anything else planned. I will just grab this. I don't understand what she's saying. The words are coming out of her mouth. But, but it's like... So you may be asking, gosh, Pam, but how did you even get to where you have this bin full of tiny scraps? How did you... Gosh, Pam, how did you even get to this bin full of tiny scraps? I'm glad you asked. Oh, good. <laughs> so um, I have a scrap storage system because again that's the kind of quilts I tend to make right using these common sizes and the, my common sizes are two inch squares three and a half inch squares five inch squares aka charm size and okay. then there's also 10 inch squares and then there are strips that are five inch strips three and a half inch strips and just to go crazy two and an eighth inch strips because that's my binding size. But oh, I could okay. also just like skim off that little bit if I need a, a two inch. So the reason that there are strips and squares, so squares are very easy to sew together, obviously, like to they like are. sizes. Yes. Don't ever sew a three and a half inch to a five inch square because that's not going to end well. It could if you wanted to make flying geese and you put them on this size. and Yeah, I don't want to do that. Okay. Not going there. 
Okay. But the strips are good because you can lay them right sides together and just, just like if you have to make four patches, so you've got a neutral strip and the color strip right, right sides together. And then you go back and cut them to make four patches, nine patches, whatever. Right. Or the rulers that I use to cut half square triangles use a three and a half inch strip instead of like a three and seven eighth inch, like which is what you would do if you were cutting the square out and marking on the diagonal. Right. So the ruler I use, I can just use a three and a half inch strip to make three inch finished half square triangles. Wow. So. That's crazy talk. If you want to know more about scrap storage systems, Bonnie Hunter has a lot of information on her website. Oh, yeah. Um, she's also got info in some of her books. Yes. And then, I have one or two of her books. Now, Bonnie uses a lot more sizes than I have. Because right. she does, so I ha I also keep like 10 inch squares, which layer cake size. I think she cuts 10 and a half inch squares. Okay, I don't know, I don't get that one. I think she pieces those together for quilt backs a lot of the time. Oh, okay. Um, and she does, I think she also does like two and a half inch strips and squares. I have found I don't use that size as much. But that's jelly roll size. It is jelly roll size. That's why I was like two inch. I would have guessed to oh, use two and a half inch because two and a half inch no, is... No, it will not. No, no, no. It's, you know, four of these. Yes, it is. But you have to trim this down. So when you sew four two and a half inch squares together into a square, like a four patch square, yeah, it finishes at four inches. When you sew a five inch square to anything, it finishes at four and a half inches. True. So that's trimming. I don't want to do that. Oh, true. So, but here's here's how the math works out. Okay. So when math. You, math. Math. So when you sew four two-inch squares together, you magically get three and a half inch. A three and a half inch square. Stop it. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. It's like a when you sew on TV. three. Or, uh, excuse me, nine three and a half inch squares together, you get a nine, nine patch, patch that measures nine and a half inches. But that's smaller than your 10 inches. Exactly. But also, if you sew four five inch squares together, you also get nine, nine and, and a half, half inches. inches. Huzzah! And then you can make quilts like this one, where you just make big nine inch finished blocks out of just sewing your nine patches from three and a half inch squares or your four patches from five inch squares. And then it's like wham, kabam, scrappy bam. Scrappy bam? Scrappy ma'am. Oh, I thought you said scrappy bam. No, ma'am. That would have been fun. That wouldn't rhyme so much. That would just be repeating the word, which is a lame way to write poetry. I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway, and then you do some little two inch wide sashing and that's pull what out you your little got. two inch squares here. And, and here is a nice, aggressively cheerful... Aggressively cheerful. Quilt. <laughs> it makes you smile, and if not, it slaps you. Yes. Slaps you right in the retinas. <laughs> so, just to make it more fun. It is. It's hilariously fun right now. Let's say you wanted a six-inch finished square. Well, you could take four of your three-and-a-half inches and sew them together and make a four-patch. And then... But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. You take your two-inch squares and you do a little two-sided That almost border. looks like a disappearing... Oh, no, it's not. Sorry. It's not. On your five-inch square, and this makes a six-inch block. And so between a six-inch finished block and a nine-inch finished block, these are very common star block sizes, too. And then you just mix it all You've up. You've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I just... I like math. I have to admit... It all works out in my head, mm -hmm. but I think for me, I got to know where I'm going. And so just having a stack of the squares. You are hopping on the bus to aggressively cheerful land, honey. That's where you're going. <laughs> That's right. You get off the bus, they stuff you right in the retina. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think for me, in my brain, I'm like... Okay, I just have more stacks of squares than I already sewn together, and I don't you know You have where. to turn them into a quilt. They have to be somewhat coordinated, or you pick a theme. So lots of times what I'll do is find You'll, you the You picked a theme fabric. with that? It was high. I don't like your retinas. Let me poke them. <laughs> That's my theme. <laughs> okay. Right. No, but frequently what I do is for the sashing, you get a unifying fabric. 
So maybe it's a print and you need, for that size quilt, I think you need about mm, half a yard or so to get okay. all those sashing pieces cut out. And so from that sashing color, because let's say it's a stripe or just some kind of funky print, the colors right. in that sashing fabric are, I then go to my little pre-cut squares and just start pulling out like all the squares that match or coordinate or use those same colors. Right. And then I start looking at, okay, I need 20 of these nine inch blocks. And I, I start with the biggest. I'm like, all right, because that's the least amount of work to sew together the biggest pieces. <laughs> so I True. look at the five inch squares and I just start laying out four patches from the five inch squares. Right, how many blocks did that get me? And I got 10 of those blocks. I need 10 more blocks to make this cool top. Cool. And then I go to my three and a half inch squares and see, okay, how many nine patches can I get out of these? All right. I got like six, nine patches out of it. I'm at 16 total. I need four more blocks. Okay. So then I look and see, can I combine, you know, like wacky land? Do I bring right. in some of these sizes? Cause I didn't have enough of these to make four patches, but I don't want to go crazy and make <laughs> like 11 billion two inch squares sewn together. Cause that's a little intense, but you could. And I do. Uh, how do I make up those other four blocks? Now, sometimes I've got a layer cake leftover piece that would match, and I just trim that down to nine and a half inches. And you're done. And it's just a bigger one yet. And I didn't have to piece nothing. That block's done. Okay. So I just keep kind of building up until I, I get keep, to 20 blocks. Okay. For this whole method mm -hmm. I, and the way my brain works, and we, we spend a lot of time talking about your brain and my brain. So I might, and we did a test not too long ago, too, and just... So I am 77% right brain creative, and she's like 77% left, left brain, brain digital. Yes. So process. Yes. How are we friends? It's really crazy. So I, w when I'm looking at all this, it makes sense, and I can logically see, but I, I guess for me, and I'm sure there are other people out there like me, but for me, it's like, I don't know where to start. It, it, feels like I don't know where I'm going. And so I, I get, like, I'm like, I have no idea where to start with this leaders and under stuff. I mean, I get the concept of how to do it, mm -hmm. but I guess the whole thing of I've got two going at the same time. Yeah. And if you don't want to fiddle with, like, all the pre-cut scrap sizes, like, it, like I said, it doesn't work for everyone. Right. Um, so then it's a matter of you need to get two projects that are I need piecing. To. Not yes. applique, none of that. That applique is cool. Yeah, but that doesn't work for this. You can't lead her and enter an applique. True. It didn't work. True. Because then you got to switch like zigzag stitch to straight stitch, and that's eh, not good. Um, so what you then do is just get two piecing projects all cut out and get all your pieces and kind mm -hmm. of what you know you need to sew together, and that's how you do it. Okay. All right. Well, I think this is be good for me to consider as something I should try to learn to do. She's not going to do it. <laughs> I love you, but you're not going to do it. And you don't have to do it. I know, but I really want to try to You don't have learn. to know this stuff because I know this stuff. True. <laughs> but I want to try to learn. I'm, always, I'm all about learning stuff, though. I am. So I want to try to learn. When I tried to teach you last time. It didn't go well. <laughs> but I think I only got partial lessons. So I'm going to, the leader in Ender stuff, I think I need to plan of what it's going to end up like, and I'll try to do it. Maybe by the end of next year. Maybe by 2020? 20? <laughs> 20, end of 2019. 2029? 2045. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe. So, maybe. All right. Well, we're going to take a little break, give you guys a closer look at the En Provence quilt behind us, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, we're back, and now we're going to talk about rulers and quilting. And not cutting, but quilting. Right, exactly. So the rulers are, first thing you need to know, the rulers are different, and they are much thicker because you do not want to accidentally sew over a ruler. True. So the, in theory, and yes. practice. In practice, too. Your foot 
your quilting ruler work foot for both a domestic and a long arm right. is a quarter inch thick as opposed to a normal piecing foot, which is usually about an eighth of an inch thick. Right. And that, again, is to make sure that this ruler doesn't slide under the needle and goes kaboink, kaboink, and then suddenly you, you're out an eye. Right. That would be bad. That's bad. That would be bad. Okay. Okay. So, so ruler basics. Yes. Go. Should you go as fast as you can? No. No. Slow down. On the long arm as well as domestic. Yes. Slow and down. A lot of that is because it is physically hard to go very fast. <laughs> because there's a lot of awkward elbows and manipulation and some grunting. Well, and in uh, on a long arm, you're holding the ruler. Well, first thing, you put in a table underneath your long arm to give you a flat base because a normal long arm average is about four to five inches width mm -hmm. of where the needle is. Um, and so you need to extend that so that your ruler's not... Going all wibbly-wobbly time. Right, timing. because you can't see as you're moving this so that table moves with you. So you need a table um, that would fit on your long arm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure... You can get that from the dealer and stuff like that. Yeah. On a domestic so. machine, this works best if your domestic machine is level with your right. table. So it's kind of set in and you have this big extended yes. bed. Now, you can also get the bed extender for a domestic machine, too, which I, you, I have with my machine, but I don't have to use it because mine's set into a table. Right. So, again, you want to extend that surface that the quilt is laying on. Right. Right. So, because you don't want to be following around and your ruler be... Wibbly wobbly. Yeah. So you want it to be able to be on a soft or a hard surface that right. you're moving it on. Um, so yes, that's what I do for that. Slow down. What are the basics? Okay. You're right-handed. I'm ambidextrous, but yes, I'm so right-handed. So on your long arm when you're using a ruler, which hand holds the ruler, which hand holds the machine? My left hand holds the ruler 70% of the time. Okay. I will change. And it depends on where I'm. Yeah, if you're on like If edge I'm or... on this edge, I'll move it to this side. I'll do here. If I'm on this edge, I'll do here. Okay. This is a little more dominant, but for the machine, okay. yes. So I am left-handed on a domestic machine. And typically what I have, I wear grippy gloves. Don't wear I, gloves. I have to because it helps me manipulate and get hold right. of the, the quilt yeah. better. So typically what I do, imagine that I am full Michael Jackson with a glove on this hand. And <laughs> sorry, no, no, I'm just not even. <laughs> I thought it was funny. No, no. Okay, go ahead. It's more distracting than anything. Okay, go. So this particular brand of ruler, Quilters Apothecary. Hey, Jamie. Hey, Jamie. Um, has this uh, awesome little thing here that you can use to grip. So what I end up doing is putting my ring finger on this, and then two fingers on this, and my thumb on the side. And then it's, you know, bunka, 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 bunka. Right. It's a technical term. Bunka, and so bunka, this bunka. hand is helping. And you made fun of the woohoos. I'm just Mine saying. Mine wasn't as loud. Sorry. Just saying. So this hand is controlling the quilt sandwich, foot on the pedal. This hand, the ruler, is also helping to move the fabric around. So for a domestic particularly, it's important to have a kind of a grippier bottom on your ruler. Now there's various things you can get. There are like little sticky dots. There are just whole overlays that give it a little more grip, but not to the point of being super sticky. I would not go with any sandpaper-based things because that's just going to oh, irritate your the quilt. fibers yeah. on your quilt. Yeah. But you need something a little stickier because this would just slide right on a quilt sandwich and not help you guide. So for domestic, you need something stickier on the bottom of your ruler. I don't know that I've ever used anything for ruler work with grippy stuff on the bottom with a long arm. No, I want to use that as an example. <laughs> <laughs> What's nice about this one for a long arm is, and this is the way this is designed, you notice this little inset, your foot sits right in there. Your machine foot, not your foot. <laughs> You're right. Uh, sits <laughs> right in there, and it allows you to follow this line that's, that's on the ruler itself mm -hmm. to go right around applique to get right next to applique. Um and this is a quarter inch away from that. If you are on, if you're lining up your foot next to it, it'll be a quarter of inch away from the edge. 
This gives you a quarter inch right next to an edge. So this is a neat little ruler with that. And so I don't want anything grippy because I'm moving it right. as I'm moving the machine to go around applique. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I switch back and forth hands as I'm doing it. So that's, but that's yeah. weird me. If it's a ruler without this extra thing, then for me it is. Yeah. I mean, imagine this is flat and it's essentially, I can get like about three fingers yeah. on the ruler and then my pinky kind of helps hold the edge and my thumb helps hold this edge. Yeah. I'm doing it that way. Um, I, and this has another little inset to where you can get right next to it if you know that that line is your, where your needle will be. So you can adjust where it is. Um, I, yeah, I move them. I don't know that I hold it like you do. I Well, I have I to because I'm using yeah. it to move fabric. Right. You can have a little looser grip on it. Yeah, because I'm moving it as I work with the long arm. And I will tell you, um, ruler work is more time-consuming and more difficult than a lot of people think. Ruler work is just going to, you're just going to whip stuff out. Ruler work is much more difficult than people realize. Mm -hmm. um, to get it slow down, so you're going slower to begin with. Um, what I do, though, like when I've decided on the pattern or whatever, and I'm doing like scallops and something, and I want, um, you know, to make consistent line or whatever, you know, a lot of times on these rulers, this is a curved one, a lot of times on these rulers, I will mark the edge of that, um, I will mark like the edge of the block mm -hmm. so that I know that this line and this line is going to give me that consistent scallop so I know where to start and stop before I move it to my next. So I would butt up the edge of the block next to, and so I use painter's tape all the time on top of my rulers to kind of give me where I'm lining stuff up. So it's a visual for me. So I'm not using sticky stuff on the bottom, but I do use stuff on the top too. Yeah. You know, if you're like wanting to do a specific scallop and that's too big, but you want that curve, I will mark it where to start and stop with painter's tape. I got to be honest, I freehanded that one. I know you I was did. like, <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I use that for consistency. Um there's new kinds of rulers, and I don't have... There's all kinds of rulers, like too, by the way. Like wacky shapes. Wacky shapes. So this one is by Dusty Farrell, quiltersrule.com. Um, and I've taken a class from him. He's super good. But it allows you to do different size of scallops or, you know... Kind of looks like a wacky gingerbread man with a cybernetic arm. Yeah, like pretty much. And this is his scythe. <laughs> yeah. Um, lots of circles. Like I've got a whole I've set of circles. Circle. I feel like circles are going to be way harder on a domestic because you've got to get around and switch hands and yeah, yeah ain't got time they for are. that. But this also shows you if you want, like on this circle, it's got the lines of where the half inch and inch line is according to where your foot will be, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I've got a whole set of different size circles, and I, but I also use these. Because I've gotten fairly good at following a marked line, I will use these to mark on the quilt and then not use it as a ruler. Mm. And then I just follow the line. But now you're still slowing down. You're yeah. still, you know, that kind of stuff. How often do you do ruler work? Usually, I'm doing it mostly on smaller projects because I know it takes so much time. It does. And yeah. And I have thought, like, oh, this quilt with all this negative space would be awesome with ruler work. And I look at it like, I I don't want to spend six weeks quilting this. <laughs> and I'm it's done. big. So I tend to do it with smaller ones because, again, the I find it more difficult to move the sandwich when I've got a ruler and I don't have my grippy hand. Right. I just saw at Market um, or Festival a a company, I think it was Dusty's company, but I could be wrong. And there may be other companies that do this too, but where they have the ruler 
And instead of you going outside of it, go inside. They have a, a way for you to get your foot inside and then you can mm-hmm. do inside. Yeah. So the ruler like have diamonds or has different shapes inside of the edge. Mm-hmm. It's the, not the outside edge you're working on. You're working on an inside edge. And I saw them where they were actually helping with domestic on free motion stuff. Yeah. Handy Quilter has a line that does that. Okay. And that's my um, mid-arm sit-down is a Handy Quilter. Right. And uh, they have a number of rulers that are that inside. Where you, and there's a little piece that, like, pops out. So you get your needle inside the ruler space and you put that extra piece back in. So right. So you don't have, like, to a big To lock you hole. in. Yeah. yeah. So that you don't, like... But it was kind of neat. She was, you were following this, and, and I think she was doing a meander. And some people get lost in meanders. Yeah. It took me a while to kind of get them. Unless your um, brain thinks like a jigsaw puzzle where you're trying to fit pieces together. Yeah. And you're like, oh, here's kind of a big area I need to swoop in there and yeah. swoop back out. Right. Lots of people's brains don't think that way, yeah. and it's hard to grasp. But once you get it, I think it's in there. But um, So she was showing how you can do a meander inside of this mm-hmm. ruler and then she just flipped the ruler all the way around and then did it this way and then flipped it this way and did it. Th- so it was really super easy. It looked like it would be very useful um, if you need that kind of help yeah. to get grounded in using. And, and it wasn't much, I wouldn't call that classic ruler work yeah. as much as I would a helpful tool for. Yeah, starting to think like that pattern yeah. and that nesting pattern, which can be, it's yeah. like thinking like a pantograph. Which right. is hard. <laughs> it's I don't hard. Do them. <laughs> I don't do pantographs because I I have to stand at the back of the machine to do a pantograph. And I think that's... And you want to see the fabric. I want to see the fabric. And not... And some of the challenges of pantographs are you run over things that, yeah. you know, like... You get a weird bump in a scene. Yeah. yeah. Where I can avoid that if I'm looking at it. You know, there's a big scene there. Let's not stick my needle in there because that could break it. I'm just saying. Yeah. I could avoid it, you know, if I'm doing an overall meander. Now, how long is the biggest ruler that you use? Because I've seen them various lengths. Um, I like the shorter ones. Because when I'm doing ruler work, I, um, like, this is a good length. This is a good one. Um, yeah. I've got one in between these two that I like. I think the um, one that I use most commonly is about eight inches long. Oh, so yeah. about hand length. That's longer than I want to use. Because I can move mine up and down really easily. Yeah. So, yeah. I have a 12-inch one, but I don't use that often because it feels unwieldy. Right. And then my sister, one time I put on my Christmas list last year um, a ruler. And it's one of the ones with, like, all different kinds of shapes. There's, like, a scallop on one side and a jig jet, zigzag on the other. And, right. like, all just crazy looking shape and my sister got it for me and I guess it had a sharp corner to poke through the bag and she just wrote a post it and she's like I don't know what this is but it tried to kill me multiple times (laughs) (laughs) that's a good one I I like this if I don't have my micro handles down if I'm doing really small micro work I can't have my micro handles down with this oh you'll whack them yeah I can't get my hand underneath where the handles clip onto my machine Mm. Um, so if I'm doing ruler work with my micro handles, I want a flat ruler. Um, although I like this if I don't have those down, um, but it depends on how small, intricate of work I'm doing. Hey, you know what we should do? What? Record a video of me using a quilting ruler and you using a quilting ruler. Okay. And All we'll right. put that in one tips video, like the difference. What kind of block should we quilt with that? Let's do the same block, then we'll show how we quilt it with rulers. Okay. <laughs> On the spot, guys, we didn't prepare for this at all. <laughs> square and a square? Square and a square. All right. All right. There you go. So we'll have a link to that. We'll get that posted before this episode. Does it have to be a whole quilt? No, it's like one block. I know, but that's easier for you to do than me. Well, let's turn it into a placemat. Okay. I just, I have to load a whole, I would rather do, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Miss, I'm so sad. I have a long arm right here. <laughs> World's I'm gonna do violin. it with, right? Yeah. <laughs> can I can mm-hmm. I fit my channel locks on and just? That's you know, not really work. 
if you that, keep remember, the straight that line, count from straight last episode line. does not count. All right. All right. You got anything else to say about rumors? Uh, slow down. Did I say that? Yes. Yeah, slow, slow down. down. <laughs> That's the key. Right. Um, nope. I'm good. All right. So, are you more of a benevolent ruler or a dictatorial ruler when tilting? <laughs> Let us know. Leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube episode. <laughs> And that's all we have for this episode. Today's show is made possible by QT Fabrics. Learn more about their fun fabrics at qtfabrics.com. And thanks also to Fomori Cutlery. You can learn how to stay sharp with them at fomoricutlery.com. We'd like to thank 77 Peaches, Big Think Productions, for helping produce the stitch. If you've enjoyed the show, please like, share, and subscribe. The next virtual stitch-in is tonight, Friday, December 8th at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern, broadcast live on our YouTube channel. And my podcast, Hip to be a Square, is out Fridays on iTunes or Google Play. And all those details and more can be found on our website, thestitchtvshow.com. Tune in for more fun and stuff. Quilting chat with friends next time. <laughs>